So welcome back to our next round, you know, and um, you already met here um, all the panelists here, you know, uh, on stage again, Costas, Julia, Dino, Denasis, Polychronis. What you didn't see is Jaco Shemoulis. Uh, he will lead uh, the panel here, and Jaco was is co-founder, CTO, technical director from Think Silicon, my dear colleague and friend, I must say, you know, and Costas, uh, sorry, and uh, Jakobos, you know, uh, leads a lot of, a lot of the innovation which came out here from Chris and it's been exported in the world, you know. And uh, so I couldn't think a better guy than sitting here and lead the next panel discussion here. So the stage is yours, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I was, just, I was really amazed by all the presentations uh, earlier, and uh, thank you everybody for your presentations. And we've seen how we go all the way from materials uh, that supply the fabs, how these fabs are used by uh, system companies, uh, such as Nvidia, Qualcomm, and then all the way to automotive, automotive companies, and, uh, and how these are used in final uh, use cases, such as the, the Astipalea project. One pattern I saw in pretty much all presentations, starting from cost presentation, is how we're going to link all the way from algorithms to materials. And actually saw this pattern also in uh, uh, Hronis presentation, how to break the barriers between software architects, uh, architecture, microarchitecture. We've seen it in your supply chain, how we will work across supply chain. Uh, so the first question is for Costas. And the quest <laughs> The question for Costa C is, why is it important to work together and to break the barriers? Okay. Thank you for sticking around for this panel presentation. There's another amazing panel coming up. I had to give the plug. I saw Pana was just around here somewhere. Um, so why is it important for us to work together? I think the needs of the market require us to work together. I think traditionally this has been a fragmented industry. And I think that fragmentation has led to both successes and I think some inefficiencies. I think the more, and I, and I, I remember some of the slides about NVIDIA, I know Qualcomm does some things, you know, I, I know Volkswagen is doing some things. Um, I think if we could all get together as, as a both open um, and available ecosystem to each other, I think we could just make a lot more progress. And I think the, the market demands more progress. We see what's happening with AI. And um, I think that's just one of the big drivers in the next decade. Thank you very much, Costa. Uh, next question is for Chronis. And uh, there's been a tremendous interest in AI, and as NVIDIA has been leading this uh, innovation. And uh, recently, for example, with ChatGPT, many people have seen the power. And then they realize that this power can really affect them in, in, in many different ways. So how do you see AI affecting the productivity landscape? and uh, possibly the job market as well, because there are some concerns by a number of people. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I, I think it will change the way we approach, um, we approach more traditional things. Things that are mundane, things that are boring, are going to not, things can, that can be automated are going to be moved to AI. I don't think that it's going to be the Terminator scenario where we all lose our jobs and uh, <laughs> we don't have anything to do because AI is going to be doing everything for us. I think it's more going to be like the Greek philosophers where, you know, we'll have time to think about the problems that actually are important and, you know, spend our time in more creative jobs. So I think things will change for sure, but I think it will change for the better. So to me, it's, it's, it's a transformative technology, but I think it's, it's not a transformation that we should be afraid or we should actually expect that out of this a lot of good things are going to happen at least that's my <laughs> my positive view of this excellent thank you Hronis. Uh, another th uh, point in the Costa's presentation was this shortage of semiconductor talent so and uh, I was really impressed by the diverse portfolio of Qualcomm and how many different market segments you are addressing and uh, how will that how does a big company address the problem with the uh, uh, talent shortage when you are hitting multiple markets at the same time? Well, 
I think it's a problem that most, I don't think it's unique to Qualcomm. I think there's problems with, in general, with getting good talent, right, and getting people who are, um, you know, committed and have the level of expertise. Um, and then part of the challenge is wanting to make sure that those people, uh, you know, once there's an, a huge investment in terms of training, that they stay on and can actually drive, you know, tremendous uh, productivity or, or innovation inside the company. So I think the way Qualcomm's tried to solve the problem, or at least uh, to address the problem, is to look at um, a variety of different areas um, geographically where we can uh, build a uh, good foundation in terms of, uh, you know, locations and then specifically uh, identify, you know, these specific, uh, you know, e excellent centers. So we're, we're not just creating a variety of different locations that have some development engineers, but that there's a mission for those specific locations and that they become the center of excellence so for the company. So I think d diversity ge ge geographically, and then as we look at new markets, there's a new set of skill sets we have to bring in, and that drives sort of another level of, uh, of innovation and, and uh, in, you know, uh, investment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, in the recent years, we see smarter and cleaner cars. Uh, Julie, what do you see as the roadmap for the adoption of these technologies? What is causing this shift? And what's really the bottleneck? Is it technology or regulation that's causing bottlenecks for adoption of this? Well, I think in the end, right, there's not a real bottleneck per se. I think if you, if you think about what's speeding up adoption of these cleaner technologies, there are, there are for sure two things. One, on the one hand side, it is regulation. And on the one other hand side, this the customers and how much of a pull comes from the customers. And what we see in the scenarios that, that we look at is in the beginning, there needs to be this regulatory push. And at one point, there's going to be a consumer pull, which takes over the regulatory push. So it really depends on where in the, in the roadmap toward, towards adoption are we. And if we, if we look today, I guess, at the most likely scenarios, what we usually expect is about a 40 to 50 percent in a more or less standard, not too aggressive scenario of of battery electric vehicles in 2030 in the production, right? So there, there will be continue, and there will continue to be quite a number of combustion or at least mild hybrid electric vehicles, even in the future, just with the old models still being in, in production. And we see that only slowly, slowly decreasing over time. But for sure, highly depending on a regulation for sure, but also of course, uh, customer asks and pull, yeah. Somehow the uh, shortage of uh, semiconductor slowed down the adoption of these cars or accelerated? I think, good question. I think it rather accelerated it because in the end there was a high, there was a push towards high margins, right? So basically, but also I mean, uh, Donna says you, you're looking at me. <laughs> So we're so happy to add, but, but I think in the end, right, I mean, the, the vehicles with the highest margins were sold in the market, and they were predominantly sold in the market, and I think besides from this, there was not a super high impact on, on that. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Dennis, is you, uh, you want to add? Uh, we lived a couple of years uh, very difficult due to the uh, shortage of uh, semiconductors in the industry. Really, the impact was, was great. It was so, so big and now it has started normalizing, still not 100% uh, uh, production availability, availability as we used to have. Uh, definitely the, the industry is, uh, has been proven by this situation that is so much dependent on the semiconductors. And uh, also you, you, you showed in the presentation how much the technology, the demands coming from, you know, the, 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 the new uh, services that the car actually were offering an array of, of uh, uh, services through the car that uh, nobody would imagine a few years ago. And this uh, has to be done through the technology, which means semiconductors. And uh, the industry proved that in the last two years, it wasn't uh, so easy for it to adopt to the, to the shortage of semiconductors. Now, uh, 
the industry is uh, thinking again about its role in this uh, in the industry, not only to uh, let's say develop and produce cars, but how it can let's say play a role in the supply chain as well in critical components like the semiconductor. Also, th this shortage of semiconductor uh, has brought uh, problems with the semiconductor supply chain. And uh, we've also seen the US Chips Act and uh, a similar thing in Europe, the EU Chips Act. Uh, Costa, how do you see, I mean, I've seen some great ideas on how to change the semiconductor supply chain. How do you think this will uh, affect uh, Europe and Greece in particular? Yeah, good question. I want to follow up on what Anasi said because this is something that that I've, I've been thinking about a lot, and that is that automotive companies have actually looked deep into the supply chains and consider semiconductors as a critical factor. Not only do they consider them a critical factor, they're looking into exactly what they can expect, what their trusted resources are, what their diversification strategy is, and this is something that used to stop at, you know, Conti or Bosch or some other you know, tier one, tier two, tier three supplier. It's now going all the way through, believe it or not, to our level. It's super interesting how reliant the, the industry has recognized uh, it, is, it is and will become in the future. This is, of course, a huge opportunity, I think, for everyone. It's a huge opportunity for the automotive companies to have exactly what they need when they need it, do better planning. And I think it's a huge opportunity for companies like us, like Applied, to think about those scenarios earlier in advance so that we can get time to market advantage for them. Specifically around the EU Chips Act, it seems like the EU Chips Act was almost framed around automotive. There are millions and millions of jobs in Europe um, just around automotive. Forget the other sectors, and there are significant other sectors that are relying on semiconductors. So when I think about the EU Chips Act, I think about it as a literally a once in a lifetime opportunity for Europe to not just catch up, but to leapfrog, I think, the global industry and to bring the, the level of incentive uh, as a multiplier for serious effects in the industry. And I think that's what's most exciting for me around segments like automotive or on the EU Chips Act. Greece can participate. The, the EU Chips Act is unique in the sense that it is a framework that the European Union is coming up with, but it is actually member state funded. So it is Greece, for example, or any other country who decides what they want to invest in their industry. And if you look at, I'm looking at Athens right now, it's spectacular. If I look at this market, I think there's a huge opportunity for Greece, for the Greek government, to actually make real commitments to actually leapfrog and get to the next level of semiconductors, uh, you know, engineering, semiconductor, I think, availability, and just deep tech in general. Um, yeah. Um. Uh, <clears throat> we've seen a, a lot of solutions for automotive. I've seen uh, NVIDIA has now solutions for automotive, but also Qualcomm has, uh, which is uh, both companies are not traditional uh, automotive supplier, semiconductor uh, supply chain. So then the question is, how do you see uh, the automotive market as part of uh, Qualcomm's portfolio? That's a good question. I think uh, for us, uh, it's one of the core growth engines for our company. Um, you know, many of the things that the auto industry um, has gravitated towards in part of the, the other two discussions uh, earlier is, is looking for ways to add more intelligence, the ability, you know, at some point to do some level of assistance with respect to uh, driving all the way up to full autonomous driving. And when you look at what uh, some of the hallmarks and what we've been doing historically um, across multiple segments investing in the smartphone, those same technologies, you know, the ability to put high performance, low power, uh, you know, low latency, high bandwidth types of uh, wireless interfaces or even wired connections, and just the core processing DSP capability all point to um, areas where we think we have some unique value uh, that we can bring to that space. I think um, our commercial success, I mean, our CEOs talked about it, has been quite dramatic. We've gone from, you know, zero to a very, a very uh, significant amount of uh, share in that space. And we, we see that as a, 
an area where we can continue growing. And some of these um, new technologies we're baking inside the company, I think when they come to fruition, they'll even add to that, add to that puzzle. And um, one thing I wanted to comment on in the semiconductor space, we talked about automotive. I think um, in your presentation, you talked about the different process nodes, right? The biggest challenge I think we face is for, uh, you know, what's considered an old process node now is actually anything above 28 nanometers, right? So I was very interested to see your, your comment about, oh, these, these process nodes are going to go on forever. I mean, we would like them to go on forever, and yet it's very hard to get anyone to invest in any CapEx uh, in the industry because everyone is chasing, you know, uh, lower process nodes, higher margin business, um, and they're very quick to convert uh, manufacturing lines over to these uh, newer technologies. So I think uh, we're facing, you know, uh, an issue where we have um, an unstoppable force hitting an immovable object, right? And I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but right now it just looks like a mess. I just want to add that, you know, in our business, what we're seeing is actually what I think you're wishing for, which is the trailing edge is still alive and well. And I think that's important. We're, you know, we're seeing 60, you know, still viable. We're seeing, you know, nodes that are much, much larger, still viable. And this is no secret. In our last two earnings report, our ICAPS business, which is about trailing edge technology, is really just booming. It's going through the roof. Um, and it's because I think there is a use case and a workload for everything. And I think, you know, NVIDIA talked about this. You talked about this. You know, I, I think that it's not one size fits all. I think that's the beauty of it. Especially in power management, right? Those are, those are larger process nodes, and that's, that's an area where um, it's additionally challenging. Tanasi, the Astipalia project is an amazing project, and I'm sure uh, Volkswagen is learning a lot from this project. Uh, what are your key learnings there, and uh, what is stopping replicating this to the at entire country? I tried to summarize some of the learnings in the presentation. Definitely, it was, uh, it was not an easy project from many fronts. Uh, there were so many stakeholders in the project. It was quite unique. Still, it is. I mean, we haven't seen somebody still copying this somewhere else. It's, it's uh, working there for a year. Uh, definitely, we have to, to involve the the society. I mean, the, the end user, which is actually the people in Astipalia, uh, this is a key learning because the real challenge we faced was that we designed the project uh, during COVID. And we didn't have the chance to, to uh, talk to the people of Astipalia at that time, at least to the extent that we would like to do. Uh, we would have uh, solved many problems uh, uh, quite early. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have to, to take them on your side and you have to share the vision. Uh, it's something that, you know, especially in Greece, uh, rumors uh, prevail and uh, uh, you have to, uh, to deep dive to find the reality, actually. And, uh, and uh, you know, you start from a, starting, from a point where uh, people are, you know, negative uh, and, and you have to reverse the situation. It's so much difficult to reverse this. And uh, actually, in, the, in this project, we, we decided from the very beginning to work together with the people. So after COVID, we went to the island, started talking to the people, to the entrepreneurs. Now we run the, uh, this mobility ecosystem together with the rent -a car companies, the local rent -a car companies. Typical island like uh, Astipalia, the rent -a car companies are all family business. So they were afraid that Volkswagen is coming to the island to take their business. Well, yeah, th that was the reality. That's what, what, what we faced when we went to the island, start working on applying the project, not the design to take in place early. And now we're collaborating with them. They are operating everything. They are the agents. We have the technology, we have the lead, and they are operating the project. And for us, what we want to achieve is next year they will take it themselves from top to bottom. We will be there to help them and assist them. This will be uh, really something that has a lot of value 
as for the Hellenic Republic, that the project stays there for the people, they take it to the next level, and we will be there to help them. This is, we are not at this stage right now, but this is the next vision. Um, I started my journey in computers, uh, writing games on a Commodore Amiga. <laughs> and the question is to Chroni is, uh, will NVIDIA stay loyal to gamer? Or will, will they get distracted uh, by AI or autonomous cars? I think part of the interview at NVIDIA is you need to be a gamer. Otherwise, you don't get in, right? <laughs> so I think and, uh, gaming is in the DNA of NVIDIA. And I don't think that it's going to go away anytime soon. We, we, we still invest. We have active communities. Um, there is e-games and e-sports and a, a lot of other things that are very active and NVIDIA is engaging a lot, both with the gamers themselves, but also with the developers. So we have a lot of active engagement, and I think this is going to just be there forever. Like the um, machine learning and autonomous driving and data center and everything else we're driving, it's, it's on top of gaming. It's not replacing gaming. That's good news, actually. <laughs> for me, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, recent geopolitical issue affecting the semiconductor supply chain. So, Costa, how do you see these geopolitical issues in our industry? And uh, will it help it grow more, or uh, will it, this deglobalization hinder growth? My, my general response is I think it's, it's, it would normally cannibalize industries. I think you have one global market, and as soon as you fragment it, I think you could potentially have a lot of smaller markets. I think the demand of semi is going to fulfill the need uh, for much more um, you know, global supply. And so I think if you have regional supply, I think that frankly may not even be enough. So I think the, the, um, the regionalization because of the geopolitics that are going on right now across the various countries, I think will, will barely keep up with supply. And, uh, and that's at least that's what we're hoping as well. Um, what does McKinsey think about that? <laughs> I think I'll, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> Next question to you then. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, so uh, we've seen autonomous cars, especially in California. Now they're out on the streets. Uh, do you see this ever working in Greece after you've seen the streets here? <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> and the cars. <laughs> I mean, if we look at it, right, um, even in very controlled situations, automotive manufacturers are very hesitant to call anything L3, right? So, and and there there is a reason for this, because it's going to come with quite a number of risks for the OEM that needs to be managed because it's just such an uncontrolled system. And at the point where everything would be automated driving out there, right? I mean, yes, this would work in Greece as well as it works everywhere else, right? Because then all the cars do behave according to compute, etc. But this transition and when to take the risk where um, and how to predict that you have sufficiently tested for the individual environment the car is driving in, for the country, for the city, um, yeah, that's going to be a big leap of faith um, that a lot of OEMs might or might not take, right? Um, and I think we have seen first steps. We have seen first officially L3 classified specifically on highways vehicles, right? So that's, that's a good step into the right direction. Um, I think Athens will not be the first city this will be rolled out. But, but, but there, are, there are other aspects with that, right? Say you have an accident with an autonomous car. Whose fault is it? Is the NVIDIA's fault? Is it, you know, Audi's fault? Is it like, there is, you need a couple of things before this gets deployed more widely, right? You need reform, you need, you need changes on the legal side. So it's, it's, it's going to take many years. And it's, I don't think it's going to be binary either. You won't have one day all cars are self-driving, right? It's going to be a progressive thing. Just to change the fleet worldwide, it's going to take 20, 30 years at a given rate of refresh, right? 
Uh, from my side, definitely it's not only technology, it's, it's also the legal framework. And uh, initially, I mean, uh, before COVID, we, the, the industry was expecting that uh, full autonomous driving would be a reality 2025, 2026. It's not gonna be that, that soon. Uh, it will happen. Uh, so the technology will progress towards this direction, but also the legal framework, as you said, needs to be adjusted in order to you know, make, make sure that uh, whoever is involved in this is uh, secured, it, it works well. I'll follow up on this. And uh, with autonomous cars, uh, is it uh, only the legal framework or is it also an ethical framework there as well? Like, uh, like we need to convince people uh, in Astipala that well, this project is good for you. Uh, w are we going to need to convince people that autonomous cars are good? And maybe later when it's proven that maybe autonomous cars could be safer than real, how ethical would it be for humans to drive a car from that point on? You're right. Uh, the ethical part and the legal part are, they somehow cross. And uh, this is where it gets uh, too tricky and, 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 and so hard to find this, this uh, framework. And in Astipala, it's going to be much easier because uh, the streets are not so, uh, there's no traffic over there. Uh, but in, in, uh, in the context of Athens or other big cities, uh, it becomes difficult in practice. And the ethical stuff is definitely a very big discussion right now. Uh, when the car has to decide, uh, on what basis is it going to take the decision to hit the, pass the, 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 the uh, uh, let's say to, to hit a wall or to hit another car or what? I mean, so this is this is uh, yeah uh, a lot of discussion and debate about it. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's see if our society is ready for this discussion. Uh, Another question, uh, well, th this time is for Dino. Uh, I noticed on your presentation, you mentioned about uh, AI and how uh, AI is gonna be uh, distributed or balanced between cloud-based services, which is, runs mostly on NVIDIA servers, I would say, and on localized IoT services that uh, pro probably run now on your smartwatch or other kind of devices. So how do you see this balance between local edge AI and cloud-based Well, I, I don't think it's, it's um, a homogeneous answer, right? I think it's gonna be a very, um, it's gonna vary based on whatever, whatever um, applications we're talking about. But in general, I think the premise that I believe in is that the cost of doing everything in the cloud is going to continue being uh, more and more expensive, right? Because it just the just the nature of of any queries that are AI based are, are much more costly than you know current searches or, or queries that are being done today. I mean, an example was something like uh, I think like ChatGPT three, right? There's like 175 billion parameters, and for every query, it's something like 350 uh, teraflops, right? In order to and you know you can go into the details of how much each token is and all that, but but it's uh, it's quite expensive. And so if you look at trying to funnel everything into this centralized uh, data center, like you can't do it on a given rack. That rack has to be networked. You can't even do it in a given data center if you extrapolate right. And that's going to have to be networked further. I know Jensen at Computex was talking about that, right? And so and so it gets to be something where. Uh, you, you, you could envision getting to a point where the, the density is so high that um, it starts becoming cost prohibitive. So I don't think it's, it's a battle. I think it's a natural evolution of the challenge is really how do we find a way to do what we've done historically like uh, when we talk about edge servers and load balancing uh, you know, with the web. It's going to be a natural progression of if you have all this compute capability on your device, why wouldn't you take advantage of it, right? It's just idling there. And so I think there's going to be uh, business models that can be developed. I think there's gonna be the ability to try to uh, do some level of uh, tokenization, basically because there'll be um, overall cost savings for the overall infrastructure. I think it benefits everybody. 
Um, so I do believe that uh, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of uh, details to be ironed out, but um, there really isn't, in my you know, perspective, an, an alternative. Uh, Think Silicon was one of the first Risk V adopters for our shader core GPUs. Uh, Hroni, how do you see Risk V or Nvidia sees Risk V? Uh, do you see it as an enabler for innovation or putting a framework around innovation that would make it more difficult as we try to link higher level languages all the way to microarchitecture? Um, first off, we have, we, we're, we're based on ARM, even though we didn't end up buying them. Um, so, um, but, but in our SOCs, we have RISC-V hardware, like the NVDLA that does a lot of vision stuff is, is basically RISC-V based. Um, I think RISC-V is great for what it does today. The main challenge I see with them is building the software ecosystem around it, right? right? It used to be, at least the last time I checked, you know, the, the, it was pretty limited on that side. So if you, if you're, what you're building requires you know, huge adoption of a software ecosystem, like you're building a general purpose CPU, then you're probably going to be limited, right? Your customers cannot actually run stuff. And at the end of the day, it's all about programmability. That's really what we've learned over the years. If you're building an accelerator, an inference engine, you're building something where you are controlling the software stack, then RISC-V is great because it's easy, it's readily available. Um, it doesn't have all the quirks that we have accumulated in all of the instruction sets over the past 20, 30 years. So it's, it's a great thing for that. And I think that over time, as the software ecosystem is going to evolve, it's going to open it up for other, you know, more general purpose computation aspects. Follow up on this. Uh, in Costa's presentation, uh, we saw uh, we are now in the fourth era that is driven mostly by AI. The second era was there was the PC-based. And PC-based was mostly uh, x86-based. The mobility era was mostly uh, driven by ARM architecture. And now we are in the fourth era, which is AI. Uh, who do, what kind of architecture do you think is going to drive this fourth era? Is, is it going to be a dominant architecture, or is it going to be multiple? Uh, from, from an ISA perspective, or from the hardware side? I, I mean, at NVIDIA, we believe in accelerated computing, right? So we're trying to build this systems that have CPUs, GPUs, NICs, like the holistic thing, and you get that on a die because of what Dino said also. You, you need to be able to pack everything together. You need to have the power savings. I think this is going to be the way that we build hardware going forward. Now, in terms of the instruction set, um, if, you're, if you're doing accelerated compute stuff, we still find a lot of use for ARM, right? The things, we, we still run general purpose stuff on our CPUs, so. Uh, I think on that side, we're probably going to stick with ARM for the foreseeable future. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go back to the automotive. One thing that struck me in your presentation is the cost of software in new cars. And uh, the automotive industry recently realized the importance of semiconductors in cars. I heard in Hanas' presentation that Volkswagen is building their own operating system. Uh, how do you think the automotive industry is ready to take the challenge of the complexity of the software, something that we're probably not used? So if we look at this, we have, we have benchmarks on like 35,000 software projects. And if we compare how the complexity has increased over time in automotive and how productivity has increased over time in automotive, we see that there's actually a spread of a 2.5 to 3-fold between productivity increase as compared to, to complexity or scope increase. So for automotive, if we talk software, there are two things that, that automotive as such needs to achieve. One thing is manage the scope, right? Right now what we see is that all OEMs are kind of announcing their own operating system. There's a lot of features that are developed and thinking smartly about what is the scope of the software that I do in-house versus what is the scope of the software that I do up, that I outsource. And in this way, manage the overall effort that is required in the industry, I think is, is step one. And the other thing, and that's in no way different from the software industry as such, right, is of course, continue to improve productivity where possible, 
by improving processes, methods, tools, etc. And um, to kind of like boost the, or like hold up with the effort that's there. Because I think we have already had a few questions on like hiring, scaling employees, etc. This is the key, the key challenge if you want to manage such an increase in scope. And Costa, there was a lot of discussion about chiplets in your presentation. And uh, we've already seen some companies adopting this, such as Intel for internal projects. But what will be the key enabler to make mass adoption of the, this new design methodology? And why would companies switch to that? I think companies should switch because of uh, time to market and I think because of cost. And I think the, the, the key enable there, enabler there, I think, won't be as fast as we think today. I think it will probably be, be per, um, I think it'll be the, the packaging technology, I think it'll be the substrate, I think it'll be the interposer, I think it'll be the things that really bring them together, the connectivity of these chiplets that will actually truly make them superior to what exists in the market. So when I think about chiplet-based systems, I think about you know what is the efficacy of that decision versus something else. Um, I don't know how fast it's gonna go. Everyone that I talk to talks about chiplets and heterogeneous integration, everyone. And the question is, how fast will it go? I don't know. Is it a five-year journey? Is it a three-year journey? Is it a seven-year journey? I'm not sure. But I think one thing is for sure. I think everyone is hunting for value, and I think they will find that value in the best way that they can and the fastest way that they can. So I, d I don't really have a specific answer, but I think that strategically everyone knows intuitively that's where it's going. And I think people are investing. I think there are frameworks from every major company out there, but I don't know exactly when it's going to hit in a, in a serious way. Thanks a lot. And uh, with that, I think that our time is gone. And I would like to thank all panelists. It was an excellent discussion, many new insights. And I would like to thank also the audience 